everyone, so this video is essentially a wrap-up of conditioning and behaviorism for Unit 5. Uh, this contains some terms that are either not necessarily relevant in any one particular area for classical or operant or observational conditioning, and are terms that essentially kind of don't necessarily fit anywhere in particular, but are definitely things that you would want to know uh, and might be relevant for the AP exam. So one of them is superstitions. Uh, most of you guys certainly can identify and define a superstition. You know, certainly one way you can think of a superstition is having a strong belief in something for which there is no real statistical evidence of it. Um, and so, and these superstitions, I will point out, they can be learned just like any other behavior can be learned um, through classical, operant, and observational learning. So imagine uh, something silly that, you know, you might think of as silly, but you know, think of superstitions such as, you know, um, let's take classical conditioning. So for classical conditioning, you know, you see a black cat, and then shortly thereafter, you get into a car accident. And then, you know, a couple weeks later, you see a black cat, and you fall down the flight of stairs and hurt your leg. And then later that month, you see a black cat, and your boyfriend or girlfriend breaks up with you that same day at lunch. You might now be doing classical conditioning. You no, know, the anxiety of the events are now associated with the anxiety now of seeing the black cat. And in the future, you might get to the point where you feel apprehensive about the black cat and avoid it because you view it as bad luck. Congratulations, classical conditioning. You've disassociated the cat with the epitome of bad luck, and therefore you've made that you know, you've made that connection. Now, what about op uh, operant conditioning? Operant conditioning, um, you know, you do something such as you have a, a pregame meal, and then you eat it, and then you do really well that day in, at, at your game, and then the next day you have that same pregame meal, and you have it again. Well, remember, operant conditioning is about you choosing a behavior. So, you have chosen the behavior, you did a good outcome, now you do the behavior again, it has another good outcome, now you start to develop this idea that this ritual or superstition brings you good luck, congratulations, you have successfully done that via a um, operant conditioning superstition. And then the last one, of course, is observational conditioning or modeling, if you see somebody else doing this. You know, if you like, if you're a child and you know you don't necessarily believe it or not or whatever, but you watch your your parents make sure. Oh gosh, you know, let's make sure we don't you know close our close our umbrella before we come in. It's bad luck or oh you know I don't you watch your parent avoid walking under a ladder or something like that. Then a child might pick that up too. Okay, or like something you, they see is lucky, and then the child picks that up too. So certainly you can pick up superstitions through modeling and imitation of others as well. So all of those are examples of how superstitions are forming, even though, again, they may not have any statistical relevance, uh, but they are easily formed through classical operant and observational learning. Uh, the PREMAC principle is a very, very important uh, term. And the PREMAC principle says, essentially, for a punisher to work, the person or animal you're using it on has to see it as punishment. And for a reward to work, the person or animal has to see it as a reward or reinforcer. Remember, back in the videos about B.F. Skinner and his work, the word reinforcer is anything that encourages behavior, and a punisher is anything that tries to stop a behavior. So if you, you know, ask a child to pick up their room, and they do, and you give them a dollar, and then in the future, they clean up their room again, congratulations, the PREMAC principle works. They saw that as a reward, and as a result of that, they did the behavior, and it is effective. At the same time, if you have a child who refuses to eat vegetables, and you punish them by taking away their dessert, negative punishment, you remove something they enjoy, and then the next time they have the opportunity, they absolutely eat their vegetables. Congratulations, you have successfully administered the PREMAC principle because the child viewed taking away their dessert as an effective punishment. And as a result of that, it changed their behavior. PREMAC principle worked. However, what if I asked you to do something for me? And I said, if you do it, you know, if you help me move, you know, 50 heavy boxes, I will give you a nickel. And you're like, uh, no. 
Well, the premac principle says the problem is I did not give you a reinforcer that you saw as a reward. You know, I might have to give you 20 bucks or more. Now it's a reinforcer. Or if I said, oh, you know, I'll give you some bird seed if you help me pick. No, you don't see that as a reward. Therefore, it doesn't change your behavior. Ergo, it's not a reinforcer. I have to find something different. At the same time, if you see a child who's, you know, if your child is doing something wrong and you punish them by, you know, taking away their screen time or something like that, and they keep acting out, well, that is not punishment because it hasn't changed their behavior. So you need to go back to the drawing board and find something that works. You know, if the child is, you know, having a tantrum because they don't want to hang out with their family, punishment isn't telling them go to your room because in their room is not their family, but is their cell phone, their computer, their TV, et cetera, their video games. That's not punishment. So if you really want to punish somebody or if you really want to reinforce or reward something, you need to make sure you find a reward or a punishment that speaks to them. That's one of the reasons why I don't understand why in many school systems, if people skip school, the punishment is to suspend them. How is that punishment? What does that do? That's not punishment in my eyes. That is, that is basically a reward. You're basically inadvertently rewarding them through the guise that you're punishing them. So it has to be enough. Like, you know, if, if every time you got caught speeding, the speeding ticket was a dollar, that is not punishment. That's not effective punishment. So punishment, it has to fit, you know, what are you actually trying to do? Are you trying to get rid of a, if you're trying to get rid of behavior, you have to know the individual and know what is going to work on them. Then implement it. If you want to reward somebody, you have to know what they would view as a reward and then implement that. That's what the pre-MAC principle says. You have to know the candidate. You have to know the participant and know what they would view as a reward or a punishment for what you're trying to do or get them to stop. And as soon as you find the right reward or punishment at the right level for what you're asking out of them, they that will work. But you have to find it. Instinctive drift simply means that um, instinctive drift simply means that some animals simply cannot learn or pick up certain behaviors, no matter how hard you try, simply because it goes against their genetics, it goes against their instinct, or it is, in some cases, just physically impossible. Uh, one example of instinctive drift that is very common is some animals simply cannot be domesticated. Like, it doesn't matter how much reward you try to give them, it doesn't matter how much punishment you give them, some animals simply cannot be domesticated because it goes too much against their nature to be wild. Another silly example, just using a silly example, rats won't walk backwards. And it isn't because they biologically can't. They just won't walk backwards. There's something about it that they will not do. They'll just flip over, turn around, whatever. They will not walk backwards. There's nothing you can do to make them do that. That is called instinctive drift. It's too ingrained in their DNA, and therefore you cannot break it with external factors. The last term is called habituation. Habituation, if you think of it the same way you would think of drug habituation, drug habituation is also often called neuroadaption or tolerance. So often if you keep, you know, if you're a regular user of a certain drug, if you're a regular user of alcohol, a regular user of nicotine, regular user of whatever, if you keep using it at the same level, it starts to have a diminishing return over time, which will force you to either have to do more or find something else. Habituation also seems to work with reward or punishment. If you keep, like every time they do something, you reward it at the same level. Over time, they can it can start to lose its effectiveness, and you either need to increase it or find something else. Same thing with punishment. Over time, punishments start to become often ineffective if it's the same level and type of punishment over and over again, the participant starts to lose their response towards it. So what often may have been effective as a reward or a punishment at the beginning, over time, if you just keep implementing it again and again, it starts to lose its power of effectiveness and eventually it'll get them to stop changing their behaviors and therefore it's no longer a reward or punishment and you need to find something else to change it up. That is called habituation. Um, if you have any questions or concerns about anything in this video, 
uh, please let me know. Again, this is a wrap-up of behaviorism and, and conditioning. Uh, again, if you make sure you know the basic principles of classical operant and observational conditioning, compare and contrasting them, um, the differences in, you know, the be behavior and, and, and um, stimuli and which one comes first and the relationship between like classical slash um, associative learning versus operant as trial and error. Uh, so again, if there's any questions, concerns, please let me know. Otherwise, that is it for this video and I will see you in another unit.